mind. I was excited when he put them in my hands. I had a fine comb, a short comb, a hairbrush, and a few guards. There were some pieces that I didn't understand. He said, lay in Clippers flat. Don't be nervous, I got your back. Take a deep breath. As I began to cut his hair, he guided me along the way. I ain't do too bad on that table, Faye. He said, One day, this will be your chair. Everything that man did, he did with integrity. Your Lord is blood, sweat, and tears of my brother and me. Help folks along the way to build a better community. Now, God. Tearing down his legacy. Good evening. I'm Rob Goodwin. I'm the Vice President of the Lyric Unlimited Learning and Creative Engagement. Uh, on behalf of the Lyric Opera of Chicago, I want to welcome you to this evening's preview of the Factotum. The Factotum premieres February 3rd at the Harris Theater in Chicago. Uh, it's one of two world premieres uh, in this year's season, uh, both based in Chicago. The other proximity will debut in March. And we hope you can make the jaunt to uh, warm Chicago <laughs> 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 to see both of them uh, have some wind and hopefully some spring. Without further ado, um, I want to introduce you to our moderator for this evening's panel portion, Damien Sneed is a pianist, vocalist, organist, composer, conductor, producer, arranger, recording artist, instrumentalist, and arts educator, whose work spans multiple genres. He is a 2014 Sphinx Medal of Excellence recipient, a faculty member of the Manhattan School of Music, and an artist in residence at Berklee College of Music. Sneed's fourth commissioned opera, his reimagined adaptation, of Scott Joplin's Tremonisha with libretto by Karen Chilton and directed by Rajendra Ramun Mahadra, Maharaja will premiere at Opera Theater of St. Louis in May of 2023. And if you have a mother like me, she's already bugged me for tickets. <laughs> so go get them if you're in the area. Without further ado, Damien Sneed and the Factotum Creators. Greetings, everyone. Welcome tonight. It's going to be a great evening. I'd like to introduce the other panelists that will be here with me this evening. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, someone who you just heard sing, a good friend of mine and brother. Will Liverman is a Grammy-nominated baritone. He opened the Metropolitan Opera's highly anticipated 2021-22 season as Charles in Terrence Blanchard's Fire Shut Up In My Bones. And recently received, yes. And Liverman recently received the company's 2022 Beverly Sills Award. Can we welcome him out now with applause? The next panelist is also a co-creator of this opera. And that is DJ King Rico, who is a multi-instrumentalist, producer, and multifaceted music industry professional with his bachelor's degree in music production from Shenandoah University. Rico is a self-taught DJ and was one of eight world finalist DJs 
in A-Track's 2018 Goldie Awards. In 2023, he will release new original songs with Corey Fonville and DJ Harrison, members of the Butcher Brown Jazz Quintet. Also, Braxton Cook and Jay Prince. Can we welcome DJ King Rico? And the next person I'm going to introduce is the co-book writer, director, and dramaturg for this opera, my friend and colleague, Rajendra Ramun Maharaj. He is a multi-award-winning Indo-Afro-Caribbean American artist, activist, and arts administrator who has worked on Broadway, off-Broadway, and at some of our nation's top regional theaters. He is thrilled to be making his opera directorial debut with The Factotum, which then will be followed up by Opera Theater of St. Louis's New Works Collective and Tree Manisha by Scott Joplin, reimagined by librettist Karen Chilton and composer Damien Sneed, myself. Please let's welcome Rajendra. And finally, last but not least, I'd like to welcome the choreographer, Malik Washington. Malik Washington is a native New Yorker performer, teaching artist, and award-winning choreographer on great projects such as Princess Grace in 2022, Bessie as the breakout choreographer in 2021, and he hails from the Bronx. Yeah. <laughs> in 2022, Malik Washington was a choreographer for Rashad Newsom's Assembly. He was associate choreographer on Four Colored Girls on Broadway and assistant choreographer on the aforementioned Metropolitan Opera production of Fire, Shut Up In My Bones. And Malik is excited to help imagine the world that will be the factotum. Let's welcome Malik Washington. <laughs> jump into the questions. This first question is for Will and Rico. Where did the idea for the factotum come from? Um, I uh, watched this documentary about Jonathan Larson's life called No Day But Today. Um, it was really inspired by it and um, you know his work and how Rent came to be. And I just found it interesting, you know, how, you know, that show is loosely based off of La Boheme and how he took a classic and flipped it and made it something meaningful and relevant. Um, and I kind of sat with that for a while. And I was, you know, I had, in the beginning of my career, I had, I had started doing a lot of Barber of Seville's um, and traveling. And, you know, everywhere I go, I got to find the black barber shop in town. It's like the first thing that I Google. And... Um, <clears throat> I was sitting in a barber shop one day, and the idea kind of dawned on me of, you know, what if we flipped, you know, Barber of Seville and, and set it in a black barber shop? You know, someone should do that. And I kind of sit on, sat on the idea for a while until um, in 2019, uh, I reconnected with Rico. We actually went to high school together, and we, uh, I brought the idea to him, and we, we started uh, collabing on it in, in Brooklyn. Uh, for a number of years and just coming up with the a plot and you know who are the characters what who would you know the count be in today's time and Figaro and so forth and um, but that's sort of the genesis from it or of it and how it, it came to be um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm gonna quote Tony, Tony Morrison so if there's a book that you really want to read but it hasn't been written yet then you must write it and and that's what Will did you know and um, yeah, when he came to me originally, I was, I was doing the, the DJ battling thing, and then I, we sang opera together, actually, in high school, so that was our introduction. Um, I sang, you know, the uh, Magic... Sang Tamino. Yeah, Tamino, like, you know, center, back in the day, back in the day. Um, 
And uh, yeah, when he, when, he, when he brought the idea to me, well, first off, the score, he sent me the music first, and I was like, wow, the score is, you know, of, of Barbara Seville, and then just, we, that's what hip hop is, right? We sample, you know, we, we take stuff from soul, we take stuff from whatever, and, and just the idea of doing that with, with opera, with classical music was really appealing to me, and, and now here we are. And Rajendra, how did you get involved, and what were your initial thoughts? Well, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm surrounded by such black excellence tonight and these formidable black men here at the Guggenheim is kind of historic and just attention must be paid, right? Um, so I got started because we were working on fire together. I was the assistant director at the Met and um, Will, on breaks, uh, I'd work with Will and Angel a lot in rehearsals and on the breaks, Will would be out in the hall in the corner, like hunched over working feverishly on something. And I'd be like, what are you doing? Like, you were like singing your heart out. You're like acting up a storm. What are you doing on these breaks? And he's like, oh, I'm working on this thing called the factotum, uh, you know. And I said to him, that sounds awesome. You told me about the idea. And this is how the universe works because from that meeting, I sit here today, from that meeting, Malik and I met, and Malik is now part of this, and so fire was a pivotal point for so many of us who dreamt of a life in opera, black men, BIPOC people, who now have an opportunity. Um, and so for me, it's a dream come true. It's something that we've always talked about, that of course we deserve a space in the world of opera. And you know, my thing is, if you give any BIPOC person, any black person an inch, we'll create the Grand Canyon, and that's what we're doing. Before we move to our performance, we have just a few minutes. Uh, what does it actually feel like realizing that you all have now created something that will go in the canon of opera, in the canon of the American musical quilt? but also something that other young uh, men of color can now look to uh, as a type of beacon. Anyone, how does that feel? I mean, I, th I think, you know, we're not the first to do it. I think what's, what's, what, what feels exciting to me is the exposure that this time and, 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 you know, this era that we're getting right now to like really just promote our work, to promote our stories in a way that we haven't been able to do before. Um, and it just feels really exciting to know that like now an, a, a kid that's 10 years old right now in 10 years could you know, reimagine another opera, like, you know, that's really exciting for me. Uh, it's, it's just a real thing. I mean, I second what you said. I mean, we're standing on the backs of the people that have come before us, and to be in this position and to tell this story, uh, you know, I'm so, I mean, it's, it's really a surreal thing. There's so much that I'm uh, processing, but it's, it's a joy to be able to tell this story and to share it with people, and um, yeah. And I feel like, I've said this to you guys backstage, that we are the sons of Scott Joplin, and the dream that he could not see in his life, we now continue that mantle. And had it not been for Emmett Till, had it not been for Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, um, had it not been at that moment, the consciousness of what is happening now in opera would not have happened because we know that, it, what year is it? And it's still taking us this time to have first when it should be 101st or 91st. So that the, it, it feels like a dream come true, but it also feels like we have a big responsibility to make sure that this continues for years to come. I'd just like to take a pause here and ask you audience, if you could help me give a round of applause to the Guggenheim and to the Lyric Opera of Chicago for making this possible. Thank you to both institutions for making this possible. So let's have another treat. Let's go to a performance. Uh, this is called Time, and we're going to hear Cecilia Violetta Lopez as Rose and Sakura Myers on piano. Time. Thank you. 
Uh, next, I'd like to ask question, a question for all of you. I'd like to start with you, Malik, and we'll work all the way down to Will. Uh, we read your bios, we heard about it, people have done their research, but let's dig a little deeper. Can you tell everyone here what your relationship to opera was prior to this process? Oh, wow. Um, I'm a dancer. Uh, I started out as a dancer, so uh, my first opera was uh, Die Fledermaus at the Metropolitan Opera many, many years ago. A very interesting way to enter the opera world, <laughs> especially having to wear the little kitten heel. Uh, <laughs> um, but after that, I actually really enjoyed the process, um, especially the choreography uh, process of it. Uh, it's very collaborative. Um, and then from there, I went to Chicago Lyric, actually, and I did La Troyenne with Helen Pickett. Um, and that was a teacher of mine that I had from Jacob's Pillow and many other times. Uh, and then the switch was next to be in fire, shut up in my bones with all of these great gentlemen and choreographer uh, Camille Brown, and I was the assistant on that. So it was a great shift of learning how to be a dancer in it and then shifting how to be a choreographer in an opera while then still being like dance captain and assistant at the same time. Many hats, yeah? So I think I was being prepared for this moment right here, uh, and I'm very grateful to be in the presence of all these wonderful artists, so yes. yeah. Thank you. So Rajendra, I know that you did a lot of work with the uh, hit uh, Broadway production of Raised in the Sun. Tell us, how did you get into opera? What was your experience before Factotum? Yeah, um, I was a theater person. Uh, and it's interesting because I always wanted to do opera, but I would walk by the Met or the Brooklyn Academy of Music and I never felt that it was for me. Like there was no, I could see the George C. Wolfs, I could see the Lloyd Richards as totem poles and as inspirations for me, but in opera I didn't have that. And so I never thought it was going to happen in this lifetime for me. Um, and I'm a firm believer in faith and hard work and serendipity. And um, so my thing is that I want to make sure that no other BIPOC or black director never sees the Met or BAM or Chicago Lyric or Opera Theater St. Louis is not their own. Um, because by us being here, it now is the norm. It's not um, something special. Uh, the special goes away when it becomes repeated and becomes a way. And so I want to be part of that way um, because I, I never thought it was going to happen. And I remember opening Night of Fire talking to Will at one point, And it was at the party, and I don't think if you remember this, but I said, this is going to lead us to even bigger things than we can dream in our lives. As great as this moment is and all the notoriety, what the ancestors have placed in our hearts is going to be bigger than we can even imagine. And I'm just so humble to be in the presence of um, excellence, but also knowing that we are in a historic moment right now in the world of opera. This is history being made. And so 10 years from now, 20 years from now, other kids who look like us, who have funny names, who dress ancestrally, will have it easier because we sat in these chairs tonight. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and next. Uh, DJ King Rico, uh, I'll call you Rico, but we're here, as Regina said, with all of these black kings. This is amazing in this space, being able to share our story. So tell us, beyond Shenandoah and beyond growing up in the Tidewater area of Virginia, uh, was it listening to opera or just jumping in right in high school? Did it start earlier? Um, for me, classical music started, you know, around five. My dad was very adamant that you know, I was a great basketball player, but also he, he had me in piano lessons as well. So, you know, learning that early from five and uh, then picked up saxophone along the way. And then, like Will said, you know, Governor School for the Arts was my introduction. So I think my first opera I was in was Dido and Aeneas. We did that year. Um, then we did Magic Flu. We did Deflator Mouse. Like, you know, so very early on, like a teenager, really, really immersed into it. Um, but my, after my sophomore year, I was like, no, nah, you know, I wanted to do jazz. So I switched over to the jazz department. I was playing sax. And I, <laughs> opera was like the furthest thing from my mind, right? And then, then Will called and Will introduced me uh, to, to my partner at the time as well. So then I started dating an opera singer. So then, I'm, you know, I'm backstage at the Met and I'm doing these things. And, and uh, so then I, 
I became really consumed <laughs> in, the, in the world of opera. And, and to this point, like this is a big moment because I didn't, I didn't realize that, oh, you can have dance in opera, right? You can have 808s in opera. You can, you know, you can, you can have us in opera. I never saw that growing up at all. Even though I was immersed in opera, I never really saw, you know, accurate representation of us at all. And so uh, it became more personal for me, honestly, like throughout this process where it's like, no, like we really do need these stories told on the stage because there's no voice to me in my mind that's more powerful than an operatic voice. And definitely no, <laughs> there's, there's no voice in the world to me more powerful than a, than a black operatic voice just because we come with so much, you know, we, we, we come with a lot. Um, and so, yeah, so for me, that, that, was, that was kind of my journey. And so here we are now kind of redefining and reimagining what opera is and what it can be. And Will, I know that you grew up uh, from a musical background because of your upbringing in the church, in the Tidewater border area. Also, your mother is Costal a musician. Kid. What did you say? Pentecostal kid. Kojic. <laughs> for those of you who know what that means. Yes, um, we're curious. When did you figure out that your trajectory was for opera? When did you know that you had the voice? What teacher identified the voice? When did it all align? Because you are the voice. You have a voice, right? Like, what, when did it happen? Um, thank you. Um, Robert Brown from our high school days at Governor School, I think, was the foundation. We, you know, my musical father, you know, he was an inspiration to a lot of the Governor School kids, some who are out here tonight. Um, and um, he was the one that instilled in me and, and he told me that, you know, I could have a shot at a career in singing. And, you know, that, that sort of stuck with me. Um, and it kind of encouraged me to apply, uh, you know, take singing to the next level and apply for um, a bachelor's in voice. Because um, originally I was, you know, my dad's an educator, so I, you know, I have a passion for, for teaching and I was gonna go into music ed um, in Virginia, but I decided to follow this voice thing and um, it's been a whirlwind ever since. <laughs> yeah. uh, those of us who love opera, who are steeped in the art of opera itself. We know that so much speaks on the stage, not just the vocalist, not just the chorus or the orchestra, but the lighting speaks, the costumes speak to us, the makeup, the staging, the direction. But in this particular opera, one of the primary languages is dance. So Malik, can you tell us how dance is incorporated, utilized, and executed as a primary language? Uh, right now, it's, it's almost as if it's a blank canvas and you have all these colors that you can play with and you continue to just test out the colors. I think that's something that I really enjoyed, that um, the splatter effect of the paint and the, the messiness of it actually also lives in the messiness of the world. The world is chaotic. The, way, the world has chaos but it has this beauty in it too. Uh, especially growing up, I, I grew up in the Bronx and Hunts Point, which is probably one of the most <laughs> interesting areas of the Bronx as it is for me growing up as a kid. But I grew up again, across, across the street from a juvenile delinquent center, but also gave me the idea of like, that's the place that I don't wanna go. You know what I mean? So, and, but also I don't want anyone else to go there either. So how can I change that while being a dance teacher? My first dance job was on the corner across from that street. So the beauty and the, the terror in that. So how can we create that on stage within this barbershop? Because a lot of the things that I've learned of how to be a man, being that my father wasn't in my life, was at the barbershop. How do you respect women? How do you take care of your community? How do you uh, learn and grow? Other men are teaching me that. So how can we create that within, you know, an eight count, you know? So <laughs> community. <laughs> community. Yeah, so all of those things are the richness and movement and gestures and, uh, you know, yo, what's up, bro? I got you. We know those cultural codes. So how do we layer them in and sprinkle them in so that it's relative to the audience as well? Well, let's actually see that now on stage. I'd like to introduce excerpts choreographed by Malik Washington, performed two musical pieces from the Factotum. We have CeCe's Dance Break and The Baddest, performed by soloist Charisma Glasper with Tatiana Barber, Anx, Noel, Eric Para, and William Roberson.
Yes. So anyone can jump in now after that riveting performance. The next question, what has been the biggest surprise for you in this process? Any of you can jump in in any order. Um, you know, for me, you know, everything we did with this, you know, we built from the ground up, you know, and we drew inspiration from Barber of Seville. Um, but over time, as we continue to figure out what the story is, is, you know, it's an original story, and I think one of the surprises for me of how the story can keep changing and how, you know, with the narrative changes, the music changes, and, you know, leaving uh, space open uh, for the collaborative process and, you know, how that's all come together. But it's been also um, one of the greatest joys, I think, of, of working through this piece um, is seeing it 
you know, from where we started to where we have it now um, with the many, you know, different changes of the characters and the storylines and things. Yeah, um, yeah, to, to echo Will's point, I think, you know, throughout this process there's been a lot of transformation, you know, that, that's occurred and I think, maybe not surprising, but the most rewarding thing for me has been like the, to see like the transformation of Will and I like as men and as artists um, and, you know, there's this quote, I think Jay-Z says it, like, sometimes the, the business in this will turn your friends against you. And, you know, that just, it turned us closer. You know what I'm saying? So, like, even backstage, we shared a moment where, like, you know, some of us are tearing up. And as black men, we don't, we don't cultivate those spaces. We don't find those spaces often. So to, to be able to have that and have that transformation of journey and stick together throughout it all has been one of the most rewarding things for me. I would say that, yeah, absolutely. I would say that um, what has been the biggest surprise is that working with Will and King, I said this to them backstage and I'll share it with all of you, are not only geniuses, but they are men of integrity, which is lacking often in our business, no matter what color the person is. And so to be in a position where they say, no, we want you, Rajendra, because you, have, you can tell the story and you deserve to tell the story. We want you, Malik. And we are carving out a black space. But not only that, we're going to hire all BIPOC designers. We're going to walk the walk and talk the talk. That is what makes this moment so powerful. Because when you are in their positions and have their status, you can have your pick of whoever you want to work with. And they chose us. And by choosing us, not only does it validate years and years of hard work, it also reminds us that when they say they want to carve a space for black men and black women, they mean it. And so that has been the biggest surprise to me because we live in often a cynical time and a cynical business. And it has put my faith back in the power of brotherhood, the power of black men lifting each other up. Like Malik, I grew up without my father. I recently lost my mother and excluding my family this has been a source of great strength and pride and teaching. So I am, as the Japanese would say, I always have an on for this experience for you as well, Damien. Um, and it has been restorative to my faith that black men can uplift other black men. It's interesting because I don't have any surprises, but the things that I'm grateful for the most is the support um, from the men here, but also from the lyric, um, uh, the support that we've had from the amazing staff, and then from my own like life. Uh, you know, I have an amazing mentor who's also my boss, um, Camille Brown, but she's also like one of my. She's also like my big sister and uh, Ricky, who's also, uh, Ricky Tripp, who also works with us. They've always been so um, uh, forthcoming with any information or anything that I might need stepping into a role like this. Um, so I'm always grateful for them and I'm always grateful for these men as well. Thank you. That brings me to our next question. Uh, we do stand upon the shoulders of those who came before us. And I have to agree with you, Rajendra. It's not just restorative, it's ameliorating to have a company like Opera Theater of St. Louis, the Metropolitan Opera, Atlanta Opera, I'm just naming opera companies, Los Angeles Opera, and of course, the Lyric Opera of Chicago, <laughs> specifically, but to create spaces like this, I do a lot of panels. I've never done a panel with people that look like me before, with all male, you know, creatives like this. So this is, leads to my next question. What impact do you envision this piece making on the field of opera and classical performing arts? Um, I will put it in the context of the theater. What it must have been like to be in the first rehearsal for Raisin in the Sun what it must have been like to be in the first rehearsal of The Wiz and Dreamgirls and The Piano Lesson and Fences. 
what it must have been like to be part of those movements that have happened in our industry. That is what this is for opera. Black people ignored opera because opera ignored us. And now, this is a North Star, one of many. We're not trying to be the savior of anything. We're trying to tell a story. But if this one star can remind the other stars to let their light shine, that's how you change and create a universe. And so this is what it feels like to me as a scholar having studied black theater and black cinema. Imagine what it had been like when you sat across from a person who was called Sidney Poitier from the Bahamas and an actress named Ruby Dee and her husband, Ozzie Davis, or a young playwright from, named August Wilson and Lloyd Richards. Imagine what those moments have meant to all of us now. And this is what the factotum means to the world of opera. It's a chance, it's an opportunity, and it's unapologetically black in its presence and its art. And so for me, that's what I, I hold on to. What, what, what it will mean for other composers and lyricists to know that now they have a roadmap. Raisin was the first black play on Broadway. Lloyd Richards was the first black director. That had never happened before. What's happening with the factotum has never happened before. And hopefully it will continue to happen time and time again. Anyone else, anyone else? And so like, this is exactly what happens in the boardrooms. Like, you know, <laughs> Regina would come with this amazing answer and we just all like, wow, okay, you got it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so we appreciate, you know, Regina coming on. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so the impact, you know, to, to echo that, um, I also feel like the impact that it will have is, is it'll give ch people a chance, like you said, um, to see what it looks like when the community comes together. Um, the story is based on two brothers, you know, who, who get passed down the barbershop, right? And, and we were very intentional to make sure that, that we saw them come together, that we saw the redemption. And we're gonna see the anger, we're gonna see, you know, the fights, but we, but we saw them come together. So hopefully people leave, you know, the theater seeing that like, we can come together, we can, we can have love. You know, I want the impact to be love at the end of the day, whether that's, you know, whether you're black, white, yellow, whatever, you know, love at the end of the day is what, is what I think the impact will be. Um, for me, uh, I think the impact that I wanted to have is for other artists to look at this and, you know, feel like they don't have to be in one lane. You know, I, for the longest time, you know, I didn't want to write anything because I felt like I, you know, didn't have the credentials or, you know, the papers to do so. And, but it was a story that I wanted to tell and I just, you know, wanted to make it happen. And, you know, that's when we started our work together. So, you know, when people see this, you know, the factotum is a, is a jack of all trades. You know, you don't have to be, you know, just a singer or just a visual artist or whatever you do, like whatever that, if there's a story that you need to tell or something that really, uh, that you're drawn to, you know, take those liberties and step outside the box and make it happen. Yeah. Now I gotta go, right? Um, <laughs> uh, I would say, um, like what Will was saying, if I piggyback on that, uh, removing the tropes that we don't have to stay in. You know, uh, I, I don't like watching TV that much anymore because I keep seeing um, black men keep playing the same things that they were playing from Nino Brown. Um, so I would like to see some other stories that don't just have me, you know, selling rocks on the corner and degrading women. Um, so to see stories like this being created, where you're actually seeing a community and seeing dialogue, I think that's really important, that that impact is gonna change how kids see themselves, uh, how parents see their children, and how others see us. Um, and then at the same time, uh, I think it'll be impactful for kids to know that there's a place for them in opera, there's a place for them on stage, even if they come from a background that might not grant them all of the uh, promise and privileges of others, but with hard work and dedication, that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, like the, the time that it's going to take to get to that place might take a very long time or take, you know, um, trials and tribulations, but it's worth it. 
And when you get to the end, you know, there, there's a little extra uh, cream there, yes. This next uh, question is for Will and Rico. Uh, before you all introduce the next excerpt from the opera, can the two of you tell us a little bit about the studio process and exactly what you're creating with this opera? Yeah, the studio process was, um, man, it, <laughs> it was a lot of fun actually, you know, Will, I'm so privileged to to work with uh, a master at his craft, which is Will, man, you know, um, man, just having headphones on and like hearing his voice come directly to my ears is like insane, you know, like no auto tune, like this dude is always perfect pitch, you know what I'm saying? So, so we, you know, the studio and, and just the technology, you know, when I, when I first started recording, um, man, like back in like 07, uh, Pro Tools had just came around, like, and Mac was still on that white Mac MacBook, you know, with the big thing. So it wasn't like it is now, right? I can literally travel anywhere with a with the studio in my book bag, and it sounded amazing. So just this era that we're in afforded us the opportunity to, for for us to really hear the opera like straight through because Will's amazing voice. So he would like play the characters. He would imitate, you know, the soprano. He would imitate Bootleg Joe. Like he would. Any, there's even some some old demos with like some skits of Will like playing like this like a radio announcer, you know, and like. <laughs> It's like mad random, but, but due to technology, we had the opportunity to really see what the work would be. And, um, you know, sometimes when we come in, we would have an idea already, and we would kind of like go through it and be like, okay, like that's cool, but like what if we go here? And a lot of times we'll be like, no, nah, man, like this is perfect already in the beginning, you know, but to the transformation, then it would be like, oh no, I see what you're saying, and vice versa as well. I would have a beat too, and I would be like, no, this is it. And we'll be like, no, nah, I'm not. Will has this face that he makes, like you can tell, you know, if it's not really it. <laughs> not a lot of words, you know what I'm saying, but I just look at his face, I'm like, all right, that's not it, cool. Uh, so, so yeah, it was, a, it was just a lot of back and forth, a lot of like trusting, a lot of trusting within the process, a lot of, um, there's so much music that didn't make the cut, you know, um, and to your point about like, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's not overnight, it's not overnight, it's definitely been a journey, lots of studio sessions, lots of writing at coffee shops, at, at wherever, just not even in the studio, just getting the, the plot down. Um, but again, like in the studio, it's, it's just a lot of fun, a lot of fun um, just hearing the characters and, and putting the beats to it and seeing what the world could be um, and really just exploring for me. Uh, second everything you said, I mean, the trials and errors of what we were doing and, you know, how to take the classical voice and, and put it in these styles, um, you know, and something that was, like, really working, we are like, oh, yeah, that's the one, and other times, we're like, eh, you know, like, there's lots of that, um, but I think it, overall, it gave me such an appreciation of what collaboration means and how when you open something up and trust somebody, it could start here, and then with other creative minds and, and the genius of people, it can elevate to something else. And over the years, you know, that's something that I take great value in. Um, and this next piece, uh, which is the prologue, uh, starts the opera off. It's two brothers that co-run a barbershop that's passed down by their late father. I play the character Mike, who kind of upholds the legacy of the barbershop cutting hair. And my brother, Garby, uses the barbershop for illegal gambling. So there's a big dispute between the two of them because the police have gotten involved. And, um, you know, my character, Mike, is worried about, uh, you know, what's going to happen to the barbershop. And in, in the excerpt I play, uh, I'm singing both voices because that's kind of like what we normally do in the studio. So I kind of over darken <laughs> my sound for the Garby character and, you know, just try and create different vibes and... You know, that's, uh, it's been such a, an amazing journey working with Rico and, and creating this thing, so, yeah. We'll hear the excerpt. <laughs> If it ain't my two-faced head case of a brother fake Smiling, think he's styling and profiling big brother Don't know how we move so differently Ain't got the same mother He can shine in the streets But he's shady undercover And the sheets This increase of police is making things strain This ain't what pops wanted for the barber shop And it's racking my brain This ain't his legacy It's weighing heavy on me This ain't a game to me Mention of his name gon' drive me all the way insane 
<laughs> well, if it ain't my having that snowflake of a brother, piece of nothing, type of trash, snake in the grass, little brother. How we move so differently and got the same mother. He lost his identity and I hate to see him suffer. Just cause I'm running numbers, I'm suddenly a Judas. I take care of my own modern day. Count the cheddar I bring in to keep this barbershop rooted. Take the register and pull out the receipts. You can't dispute it. I need to holler at you, Garby, cause things is feeling funny. How you tracking with all of this? Bags of extra money. You're smoking. Oh, I'm good, man. I understand. Gotta set the example, Mr. Community Man. Damn! Look at those hips. What Ooh. you think? On in mic, I said, look at those hips. Say what she think on in mic. Another fashion overfit. You can tell she kind of thick. You're trying to holler, Mike, cause we can go and get a real quick. No, no, man, Ooh. I ain't really got the bandwidth for them games. You seen the feds come and bomb, and we can die. You need to chill, little brother. Everything is all intact. Don't you know Ooh. you mean? Got your front and back. No, we could go to jail and we could catch a case. Then the government gon' come and put a lock on Pop's place. Hey, Goblin on me, it's a wild goose chase. Man, you can rest easy. You looking tired in the face. Wait. Wow. Yes. Brilliant. Brilliant. So here we are, top of 2023. We were sequestered at home during a pandemic. The untimely death of George Floyd pushed all of us around the world, around the globe, into a place to put emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Many people begin to have conversation about what was necessary for change, how we could come together unified, knowing that music is a universal language, but specifically opera. It's a different art form because it's very unique. It's brilliant, it incorporates so much. So gentlemen, you've spoken about uh, the importance of this type of work, and you've responded to my questions, and you've done a phenomenal job telling us about what it will be like for those who look like us, the legacy that we put forward. Uh, our ancestors and those coming behind us. What can you say for everyone here about why it's important that major companies present opera that is created for the global majority? From another person's vantage point or point of view, outside of it being a beacon of light for others coming along the trajectory or the path, why is it necessary for the world, and particularly in the opera, to embrace this new space to show a full spectrum of majority, of color, of culture, of peoples. I mean, it's it's so important for our stories to be told. I mean, I <clears throat> remember I did fire shut up in my bones and um, you know I would look out after the show and see such a diverse crowd of, of people and that just goes to show you know um, when you create space um, for other stories to be told you know it, it it's something that's it makes the art form accessible um, and relevant and it's um, it's something that we really need yeah, um, I have a little bit, you know, different perspective on, on that. Um, you know, for me, like growing up in Virginia Beach, you know, being programmed by the, the education system there, governor school was a blessing, right? To, to go to governor school outside of regular public school, that was a huge blessing for my life, um, for sure. So like, you know, being programmed in Virginia Beach and just under, and, and getting like their perspective of how to live, like has, has led me to now understand that like, my thing is like, for the young black youth, like take more chances to tell more stories and open our own venues. Um, it's not, you know, necessarily about 
it being necessary for them to let us in as we have the power as we can see to create our own. And that's my message is just take more chances, do it on our own. We're here, we can do it. Amen. I mean, I, I think um, I think about nights like this. Like, I look around the room, and this is literally a dream come true for us. We were backstage saying, and it matters. It matters that opera houses that are well-funded look to the entire community and the American experience. Certainly, there is room for Porgy and Bess, but that wasn't written for us or by us. Um, right? Right? Um, and so I think that when, when we allow, when we are allowed to have the financial as well as the artistic um, space to create and take control of our narratives, um, I think that is honoring the legacy of George Floyd, of Trayvon Martin, of Emmett Till, of Philanda Castile, uh, Sandra Bland. The, it, we honor them by allowing us to make sure that in every city, an opera house has a Latinx, a queer person, a trans person, a black person, and they should have a right to see themselves reflected on those stages, their full humanity. And so I think that that's something that is the responsibility of all of these major institutions. Um, and to look at, I think what was so beautiful that you both said was that this started in high school, this partnership. And I think that there's something really important and a responsibility that these opera houses have to connect with public schools and creating opera as an opportunity for them. Not musical theater, not just film and television or Broadway, but opera as an art form that, you know, Jesse Norman and Paul Robeson and Marian Anderson did not go through what they went through so that black people could not see this space as their own. I think it's important because empathy can be taught through art. The idea of seeing someone else's struggle and story, um, you get to see an insight of where you connect your story to that person. So then you realize that you're not far from that person. Instead of the idea of race, color, creed, sexuality, you're realizing that you're all human beings. And that's more of the conversation that needs to be had around the world. Uh, not just in opera, but in art in general. I've had this conversation in the last couple of weeks because how many shows that I've seen that have black amazing artists in it that have been closing early. Why? We're not Band-Aids. I'm not here to fix something for you then for you to like toss me to the side. I'm here to stay. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be here. I want to salute all of you. Uh, for creating this, and you're right, this becomes now a didactic tool to educate the factotum, to educate people about the African and African American diasporic community, the language, the codes, and the beauty. My final question or request from the four of you, I'd like for you to succinctly give us a statement so that we all can take this with us. Just simply, what do you hope, as the creators, what do you hope audiences leave with? Coming together, that simple. <clears throat> um, leave with, um, yeah, leave with love. I think, again, leave with love. Leave knowing that, uh, that that you can choose love, you don't have to choose hate, you can choose love. That our ancestors have prepared us and that storytelling is storytelling is storytelling. You love being in this world as much as I do. And we will, yes, beautiful. And 
Malik, Rajendra, DJ, Rico, and Will, in that order. Anyone you'd like to thank for the process, your process, or for this evening, for this space, for this time that we're in? Oh, I'm gonna always thank my mother, because without her, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so my mom. I want to thank my mom who's watching and always watching. I want to thank my family. It's been a long journey, a hard year, but I'm grateful to stand with all of you. And my mom dreamt this for me. She worked really hard carrying a mailbag for many years so that I wouldn't have to. So my mother, my teachers, my friends, and I have to say, Chicago Lyric for providing the space, the Guggenheim for providing the space, and for all of you showing up and providing the space. Absolutely. Same. I'm going to echo everyone with, with my mom for giving birth to me. My father raised me, um, actually, and, and, you know, being a black man in America, raising me, putting me in piano early on. I, I can't thank him enough for that. And uh, all of the people that have helped us throughout this process, you know, like Will said, 2019, 2018, really, it's been a journey. And, and all, of the, all of my team around me um, that have helped in the meetings, that have helped with the concepts, that have helped with the writing, my, my musician friends that have sent, sent stuff over for us and, you know, just, just out of love. And, and, um, and yeah, definitely, you know, for me, a huge thank you to Will, you know, for, for, for trusting me with your idea, trusting me with your baby, um, coming to me and, and, you know, allowing us to give birth together. You know what I'm saying? So I, I appreciate you, my bro. Oh, and, and, uh, Shout out, shout out to Lyric, too. I do, I do want to shout out to Lyric because their whole staff, there's been a lot of people at Lyric that have been instrumental with this whole process, uh, the ups and the downs, but through it all, we have the, the world premiere February 3rd. So th shout out to Lyric and everybody for being here. I'm thankful to all my brothers up here, Rico, Rajendra, Malik, Damien. Uh, thankful to my family. Um, and all the ones who've uh, supported me and, and been in my corner of, um, and uh, to the Lyric Opera of Chicago for, for giving us this platform and opportunity and to the good folks at Guggenheim for making this event possible tonight. <clears throat> And before I introduce the final performance, collectively, again, we want to thank the performing artists, all the musicians, Sakura Myers, uh, Cecilia Violeta Lopez, and the ones that I'm about to introduce, the stagehands, the lighting people, everyone from the Lyric Opera of Chicago, the staff for making this possible, everyone here at the Guggenheim, even the volunteers, the ushers, everybody, the people that printed the program, but most of all, collectively, we'd like to thank you. So from our hearts to yours, thank you all for sitting here, listening, and being in this space to receive and hear from these great, uh, sagacious, intelligent, young black men. So finally, Wait, and Damien, Damien, <laughs> Damien, because, Damien, for, for being such an inspiration to all of us. Will and I were saying before, you are just such a light in this industry. You are um, a great source of inspiration and black excellence. I personally feel very blessed to stand at the beginning of my opera career with you two this season and to end my opera career this season with Trimanisha, my first year with you. So thank you for being such a king and being a mountain that we can stand on and always turn to. We love you so much. Our final performance, Fantasy or Love from the Opera, with Martin Luther Clark as CJ, Will Liverman on piano, and a phenomenal string quartet featuring Monica Davis and Hajnal Pivnik on violin, also Josh Henderson on viola, and Terence Thornhill 
on cello. This will conclude our program. Ladies and gentlemen, please receive them as they perform Fantasy, Our Love. Oh.